Well, good morning, Calvary family. Let's do this quickly to get it out of the way. I was working for my wife. (laughs) And it's just one of those fluke things where you pick something heavier than you should be lifting, but you pick something up and then you turn. And uh, where's Rachel Beatty? There she is. They actually read my MRI the same day. And I got in to have an MRI the day after. That part's cool. It's actually been bad for about, well, this will be the third Sunday now. I just try not to let on. Um, but I, there's a partial tear of the tendon that goes from the elbow to the bicep. And so now they're just waiting for, you know, when surgery takes place. So there we are. A pastor, does it hurt? Yes, it hurts very badly. I'm saying this now so that you all don't ask me individually, okay? It hurts very badly, but it doesn't hurt as bad as what I went to the doctor for in the first place. This was secondary. So we're getting the other thing looked at, and you may see more stuff. Won't that be a blast? I'm just thankful that it's just in time for summer. (laughs) Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen? I mean, that's the deal. That's the deal. All right. Are we good? All right. There is this this TikTok trend that is going around. It's also on the shorts and the reels and everything like that. I have to get clued in to stuff like this. And um, maybe perhaps, maybe perhaps you've seen it, maybe some others of you have seen it, where the, the husband <clears throat> is not in on the prank that the mom and the child are going to be playing. And from the other room, the mom will tell the child to do something, and the child will snap back and will tell their mom to shut up. In every one of these TikToks, in every one of these short videos, you see the dad first, absolutely stunned. Just, there's no way that I heard that. And then he gets up and he starts taking off after the kid. Because you don't talk like that to your mom. And as he's running toward them, you have both mom and child screaming, It's a prank! It's a prank! It's a prank! We were just playing. I think it's a stupid prank. For so many reasons and in so many ways. However, it revealed something. It, one, it's always good to have dad in the house. And it's good to have dad in the house because... While fathers are loved, they are also to be feared. I don't know why that is. I don't know why it is that kids think that they can talk back to their mother. I think it has something to do with them being with their mother all the time. And so you get familiar, and you have this relationship. And mama empowers you. Mama blesses you. And somewhere along the way, usually about three years of age, you think your mama's equal. But you're not. And all the mamas in the house say, Amen. But you've heard stories. You wait. Some of you experience this. You wait until your dad gets home. Oh. And dad always came home. but I'm blessed by that. I loved my father and love my father. I feared my father and rightly feared my father. And when I'm talking about fear right now of my dad, it's 
It is much the way, different dynamic completely, but it is much the way that I mean in fearing God. There, there is this awe and reverence for my dad. He can do anything. Right? That's how I've always looked at my dad. He could always take care of anything. He never looked at instructions. So it may take him two or three times to take care of the whatever it is. But the first thing we did when we opened a box was throw out the instructions because we know what to do. But I would see my dad and I'd fear him. That reverent fear, but then a real fear of causing displeasure in my father. Fear of the discipline of my father. That did not diminish my love for him at all. In fact, it was a very real aspect of my love for him. I want you to remember that thought as we engage the few verses we look at this morning in 1 Peter. So please, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 21. Rightly fear your father, as together we remember some things about him. We have just come, in, we have just come out of the context of prepare, plan, Execute. Be holy. Because God is holy. And he has called you, us, to holiness. Verse 17. And if or since you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest, fully revealed, in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory in order that your faith and your hope are squarely set in God. Hallelujah once again. Verse 17. Love your father. Love your father. But fear is discipline. As New Testament saints, as New Covenant people, we don't like talking about this at all. Somehow we've gotten in our minds that this isn't a part of our life at all. That any kind of judgment that God would have, that's Old Testament God. New Testament God doesn't judge anything. He's just wonderfully gracious, wonderfully merciful, wonderfully kind, wonderfully benevolent. Is he all those things? Yes, 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 and yes. Does he still function as judge? Yes. And a father who does not discipline when it is needed for instruction and correction is no caring father at all. They may have the title, 
They just are not enacting the reality and character of what a father is supposed to be. Love your father, but fear his discipline. Remember your father is a judge. I think that's important for us to remember, right? Remember your father is a judge. If you call on him as father, which you do, there's an assumption here that you are praying, that you are saints, that you're calling upon him and calling upon his name. You must recognize if you call upon him as father, he is the one who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. Now, there is not an indication, except for context, there's not an indication if this is non-believers, believers. We know it is specifically for believers because of the text where it's written in this letter, right? We also know from other places that God judges the non-believers as well, right? And the comment that's made here is striking. Because when we participate in sinful activities, and we know them to be sinful activities, tell me that you've never done this, okay? Tell me that you have never compared your sin to the very egregious sins of other people. So that I feel pretty okay about mine because, praise God, at least I'm not like I mean, did you hear about them? God, let me fill you in if you don't know. Forgive me of my sin, but let's put it in context, Father. This sounds like conversations that you have with your children in a household when you're growing up. This could sound like some of my grandchildren. Yeah, but he... Well, why did you, I'm talking to you right now. Well, yeah, yeah, but he, you've got to include him. He's the one who started, I'm not talking to him, and his story is not your story. Your story is your story, and I'm talking to you. Is what you did correct? Is what you did right? He started it. That's not what I'm asking. Are you willing to recognize that what you participated in was wrong? His was worse. There are parts of us that never really grow up. Because while we don't say the words, often we have these conversations and thoughts toward God. I thank thee that I am not like those who really fall and bring reproach upon your name. Mine's just a small sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then we come to this verse, and it says, He judges impartially. He shows no favoritism. Right is right, wrong is wrong. Consistency with my character is consistency with my character. Inconsistency with my character is inconsistency with my character. Remember, we have just come out of be holy. Because I, the God who created you, sustains you, made you a new creation in my son Jesus Christ, because I am holy, you are to express my image in the world. No partiality. Father observes, he knows. And what we are told is this. Yes, he is our father of his own choosing and our surrender. Praise be to God. Amen? That's our starting point. But as a father, he still remains judge. Again, a father who truly loves will discipline. 
So in saying this, the Holy Spirit is telling us, you need to know, you need to know God the Father, but you need to ex- expressly know that he is judge who does not show favoritism in his judgments toward the deeds that people do. So you know what you need to do? The end of verse 17. Conduct yourselves accordingly. This is really pretty straightforward teaching. Amen? Because God is holy and he's called us to be holy, and because God has called us into his family and made us his children, and as he functions as judge, you need to respond accordingly. And your conduct, the, the conduct of your life, every area of your life now belongs to God. And the Father watches and he observes and he judges, showing no favoritism. No pastor has any claims on God the Father that any believer does not share. No Christian superstar influencer, whoever they may be, has any claims on God that young people, teenagers, young adults who observe their life, you have the same claims upon God that they have. No favoritism. Conduct yourselves accordingly. Why? Why? Verses 18 and 19. Love your father, but fear his discipline and live accordingly. Because he first loved you at great cost. That's it. Why should I love my father and at the same time fear his discipline? Because you need to remember who your father is. He has protected you from the evil one. He has brought you and adopted you into his family. He has taken you from death to life. He has provided everything that is necessary for your salvation. Live accordingly. Why? Because he first loved you at great cost. You were ransomed. You were ransomed from the worthless, sinful patterns of life that we brought with us, that we learned from our families, we learned from our friends, Some of those worthless, sinful patterns of life we we established on our own in contradistinction to our families, our families and parents who provided an environment for spiritual growth, but we, we spurned it, we mocked it, and we walked away from it. Walk accordingly to the God who is holy who has made you to be holy as his children, let us joyously, faithfully obey. We were ransomed from the worthless, sinful patterns of life that we lived apart from Christ. Hallelujah. Are you saying that everything that I did was evil before Christ? Since we're not teaching in the categories of philosophy and moral theology, I'll say I am fine with saying that those who do not know Christ, they do some good things. I don't know a better word to offer it than when they actually enact image-bearing and do good things.
but they are incapable of doing things that merit the favor of God. A non-believer cannot do any activity that merits favor towards salvation with God. God has provided salvation. God is the one who has redeemed. God is the one who has ransomed us from the feudal thoughts and feudal patterns of life that we lived apart from him. Many of you know this verse because it cuts us deeply and quickly. We praise God that we were ransomed from those feudal ways. We were chasing after the wind. And we'd constantly grab air. And we would make no progress toward God at all. In fact, the harder we tried, the further we drove ourselves away from God because the more we trusted in ourselves. What a dangerous pattern. But verse 18 makes clear, you were ransomed. You did not ransom yourself. I did not ransom myself. We were ransomed. It happened to us. It happened for us. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited by your forefathers. And I was ransomed at way too high a price. He uses the best materials that we can possibly think of here on earth. You were ransomed. Not with perishable things. The best of the best of what we know. Like silver and gold. That which is worth so much here on earth. That which could buy us any material good that we might want. His point, all of it, is temporary. All of it is transient. All of it is perishable. We were walking in the futility of our minds. That's what he's saying. You've been ransomed from that. And the price was not paid with silver and gold because that's here today and gone tomorrow. You know what you were bought with? Yeah. Every believer in the house, I'm going to ask you to take a minute right now. This is good for us again. Take a minute right now. Thank God that we have been ransomed through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Apart from whom, apart from which, we would have no hope. This is a good time to give thanks.
Brother Al Cuthbert. As loudly as you can, would you stand and give thanks that God has ransomed us from the futility of our lives apart from Christ? On behalf of the church family, lead us, please. We come here this morning. Again, we've been aware of what you have done in paying an incredible price to bring us to yourself. Oh, Father, thank you. On behalf of this body together, we give thanks. We would not be able to be here this morning were it not for Christ and his death on the cross, giving us life, giving us freedom, forgiveness. Oh, God, thank you so much. Father, I pray that as we continue to look at your word, may that reality sink deep into our souls. May it impact our day by day. And may we again just rejoice with gratitude every day for that salvation we have in Christ. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tom Lothamer, over here, Pastor Paul. Tom Lothamer, would you stand and pray on behalf of your church family in thanksgiving to God for the the blood of Jesus Christ that has paid the penalty for our sin. Dear Father, uh, I marvel every single day that you sought me out. You made me aware of my need for Christ. You made you made me aware of my need for forgiveness of sins. And Lord, you so graciously made me aware. And Lord, I would, by the grace of God and the Spirit of God, I embrace that. And Lord, I, I know that as a congregation, as a community of believers here, we can all say that. It was you that had done it. It was because of your life, your sacrifice, your blood that made all of this possible. And so every day, Father, we, we think of that and we praise you and thank you. And Lord, cause us, I pray, because of this, to live every single day uh, living by the Spirit of God, seeking out what you'd have us to do. And Lord, even to be a better community of believers to each other and to those around us. Father, thank you. Thank you again for the shed blood of Christ. Thank you uh, for making us aware of our need. And then, Father, for helping us to live each day by the Spirit of God in victory and power. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Al Cuthbert was raised within the context of a Christian family. Was, was given a spiritual legacy and heritage. We had a father who ministered, not perfectly, but had a father who ministered, where Al had some clear representation of what he could grab a hold of in advance during his lifetime. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was bought, not by his father's faith, he was bought through the same shed blood of Jesus Christ that saved his father. Tom Lothamer, this brother did not have that background. He didn't, he didn't have that father who passed on this spiritual heritage and legacy to him. But the same shed blood of Jesus grabbed a hold of that brother's life and just as he saved him from the futility of the ways of the conduct of your life and where it was where it could go apart from Christ the same thing's true for this brother who was born and raised in a Christian home 
These two men have significantly different backgrounds when it comes to their thoughts about fathering, fatherhood, trusting. Knowing that a father in discipline was doing it for the best, there's, there's different thoughts until God redeemed that brother, God redeemed that brother, and ransomed them both from the futility of a life apart from Christ would have brought. And as a community of faith, we're blessed. Amen? And the stories like that go on and on and on in multiple people in this family. We were bought at much too high a price. Given that we were purchased through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, walk accordingly. Conduct yourselves, is what the text says. Conduct yourselves. Just walk accordingly. Don't you dare treat the grace of God cheaply. I'm speaking to me as much as anybody. We should fear treating the grace of God cheaply. Yeah, Jesus died for my sins. Amen. What impact has it had on your life during the course of these past seven days since we last met together? No, don't get me wrong, Pastor. I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the grace of God in my life. I don't think he really matters about the sins that I'm participating in because, again, tying it into the beginning of our conversation here, my sins aren't nearly as bad as the big gross sins that other people participate in. Live your life accordingly to the price with which it has been purchased. There is no greater price than the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Walk accordingly. Do not take this grace for granted. I remember when we first came to Christ, Boy, we didn't take his grace for granted then, did we? Each of us was moved. Because for the first time in our lives, we really, really agreed with God as to what he had to say about our sin and our sins. And we were so thankful. Many of us cried. Many of us cried in, in prayer. Thanking God for the salvation that he gave to us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We couldn't have been more excited because we knew, we knew what we were being saved from and what we were being saved toward. And then two years went by, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, twenty, thirty. And we got used to we became overly familiar with in a way that we stopped appreciating the price that was paid for our redemption. May it never be. In this sanctuary, we should be the most thankful people on the planet. Amen? And gratitude has a certain look to it. It does. Gratitude has a certain joy with it. A confidence, even in the midst of trials, even in the midst of disorientation. How do you continue to walk? Well, 
the reality is that I, those of us who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord, we've been bought through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and I, I can't be taken away from his hands. And ultimately, I have nothing to fear. See, this fear that we're talking about here is real-time presently. Some commentaries and commentators are trying to say that this, this fear is, and this judgment of God, that this is only a future thing that Peter's dealing with. Not true. Not true. None of us who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord, not one of us, needs to fear of final condemnation before God. Christ has already taken care of that. That's why it's clear in the context that there is a real fear of the discipline of God because I'm not acting accordingly. I'm not living up to my family name. Is everybody in the house with me on that one? I'm not living up to my family name. There is, there is something, you've heard me say this before, and you can say this about your families as well. There is something about being a Halstead that matters. You can trace that all the way back to England. It matters. There is a heritage and a legacy that is there. It matters. My dad. Is that something that a Halstead does? No, sir. Then why are you doing it? Dad's always asked that follow-up question that a kid when he's young probably is honestly answering, I don't know. I don't know. I lost my head. Mm. Don't lose it again. We bear the name of Jesus Christ. Those of us who have been bought with the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we, the name of Jesus Christ is to be visibly displayed in our lives, the conduct of our lives. Why? Why did you do that? I did that because it's consistent with the character of Christ. Yeah, but it, it would have been more profitable had you done this. Right. I also would not have been living up to the family name. I'm sure you've heard the story before. In a great battle, there was a Greek infantryman, if you will, a warrior, and the battle started raging, raging hard, and he ran away from the rest of his crew. And he was brought before Alexander the Great when they found him. And as he stood before Alexander, Alexander asked him his name, and his name happened to be Alexander, who looked at the person who shared his name and said, you have a choice. You, you change the character of your life or you change your name. That's pretty powerful. God didn't call us to tell people, I'm a Christian. And then live lives that have no visible difference from anybody else in the world. He called us out of that kind of futility. He brought us into his household, made us his children, gave us the family name, and said, I am providing, I'll protect you, I'll provide everything that's necessary for you to live according to my name. No excuses, no favoritism. 
Just be holy as I am holy. That fear is going to be a motivator of my discipline. But ultimately, you should be motivated by gratitude. You ask, how did I love you? I sent my one and only son to die on the cross to shed his blood so that you could be forgiven. Do not treat that cheaply. Do not take the grace for granted. Rightly fear your judge and do not displease him. Back to verse 17. No favoritism. I'm not going to read it, but I encourage you to read this afternoon Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11. A familiar text to many that points out once again a truly loving father will discipline his children. Discipline in the short term, not pleasant. Everybody in the house says amen. But in the long term of who he wants us to be for his honor and glory, it is good. You've experienced that in your own families. So conduct yourselves accordingly. So we have love your father, but fear his discipline. And then in verses 20 through 21, we close up shop and we say, love your father and trust him as savior. Love your father, fear his discipline, but in 20 and 21, love your father and trust him as savior. Just look at how those verses unfold. He planned our redemption in eternity past. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. He planned our redemption in eternity past. but was made manifest, it was revealed in the last times for the sake of you. That last half of 20, he sent his one and only son for our salvation. He made him fully known. I wonder what God is like. Look at the person, work, and teachings of Jesus. for you will see it on full display. Love your Father and trust Him as Savior. He planned our redemption in eternity past. He sent His one and only Son for our salvation, verse 21. He is the one upon whom we are totally dependent even now, who through Him are believers in God. Any amens in the house? Not only did Christ reveal, not only was Christ fully revealed, And not only did God fully reveal himself in the person, work, and teachings of Jesus Christ, but right now it is through Christ that we are believers in God. Hallelujah. The middle part of verse 21. He raised Christ from the dead and glorified him. The last part of verse 21. Thus, he is the only one in whom we ought to ultimately place our trust and hope. It's quite wonderful. Love your father, but fear his discipline. Be holy as I am holy. Love your father and show in fear of displeasing him and also gratitude for all that he has done in ransoming us from the worthless, sinful patterns of life we lived and to salvation. And love your Father and trust Him as Savior. He is your protector, provider, deliverer. He planned our redemption in eternity past. He sent His one and only Son for our salvation. He is the one upon whom we are totally dependent even today. He raised Christ from the dead and glorified him, and so he is the only one in whom we ought to ultimately place our trust and hope. That's it. That's it. 
the God whom we fear as judge is the same God in whom we trust and hope forever and ever and ever. So live every aspect of your life accordingly. Conduct yourselves worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Conduct yourselves accordingly. You have a heavenly Father who has purchased you. In gratitude, conduct your lives accordingly. You have your Heavenly Father who gave His one and only Son to shed His blood so that the futility of the sinful patterns of our lives that once were would be removed, would be forgiven so that we could walk worthy, walk accordingly to the character of the God who saved us. Walk worthy in full faith and trust. That this God who is our Father, this God who rightly judges and disciplines, is the God who ultimately saves. So that by God's grace and for His glory, perhaps we could encourage one another by looking at one another and saying, just wait till dad gets home. Yeah. Even so, come. Father in heaven, bless your people. Those of us who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord, we are overwhelmed by the price that was paid for our sin. And we come humbly before you in the name of the very person whose blood was shed. It is in Jesus' name that we appeal to you, Father. It is in Jesus' name that we have the right and ability to come before you. It is in Jesus' name that we once again say, Father, forgive us for the sins that we have committed against you. Forgive us, Father, of the sin of taking your grace cheaply or of becoming overly familiar, that we forget. We forget the cost. Forgive us for nonchalantly walking into places into circumstances that we know would be sinful, and yet we did it anyway. Father, renew our minds through your word by the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Let us encourage one another that you are our Father who disciplines, but that we have full trust in you as our Heavenly Father who saves We pray, Father, that perhaps on our electronic calendars, we might put at the top of every day whatever follows is for the glory of my Heavenly Father. Whatever this day holds, is for the glory of my heavenly Father. Because whatever follows must be tremendously important because we exchanged a day of our lives to fill it with that. Cause us to be circumspect to honor your name. We pray these things in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. 
Amen. Go in his grace and peace.